me to um, introduce our keynote speaker for today. We're very grateful to have uh, Professor George Mackay coming down from uh, Lancaster, in fact, but, uh, but based in the University of Salford, where he's Professor of Cultural Studies um, and has been since 2005. Uh, he established and uh, directed the uh, Communication, Cultural, and Media Research Center there. Um, and previously he held a similar chair at the University of Central Lancashire. In September 2012, he took up a three-year AHRC Leadership Fellowship for the Connected Communities Program. His research and teaching interests are in alternative culture and media, the cultural politics of music, disability, festivals, and gardening. Uh, he's written or edited numerous books and collections in these fields, and I know, uh, for my own part, I've read his book on the cultural politics of jazz in Britain called Circular Breathing, and I can highly recommend it, uh, and also his book on the Glastonbury Festival, and they've both been uh, very influential in informing some of the work that, uh, that we were doing in our own live music research here, so um, really excellent work. Uh, he writes for both academic and non-specialist audiences, producing academic monographs aimed primarily at a university readership, uh, and has also written books for, the, books for the informed, more general reader, in particular for those interested or engaged in social activism, music making, community, and cultural action. Uh, and he has a new book coming out next year, uh, which is very exciting, five years in the making apparently, it is called Shaking All Over. Popular Music and Disability, which is to be published by the University of Michigan. Do I yeah, have that correct? Um, uh, but today he'll be speaking to us about festival, place, industry, and community. So please welcome uh, Professor George McKay. Thank you. Anyway, all I did, right, was go through some of my shelves, you know, in the last few days. God, why, why, why did I need to do that? And <laughs> This one on the left here is me. Uh, my first festival was in Reading in 1977. And then uh, the one, but the, you know, we didn't have camp then. And uh, the, the one on the left is me in 1987, at the lady standing fit. Uh, the one below that is Research in Glastonbury in 1999, when I wrote, um, I went there to write this book about, you get it for about two pounds, <coughs> remained a shop, you know, nowadays. <coughs> but still all right. And then the third one was me as uh, I was a professor of res in residence at Kendall Calling, which is a kind of boutique festival up in the Lake District. Um, last year, I think, last summer. Um, they said, we'd love you to come and we'll put you in the spoken word tent and you can do some lectures. And when I got I said, yeah, that sounds fun. <coughs> and then when I got to the spoken word tent, it was actually the comedy tent. <laughs> <laughs> In this lecture, I want to talk about early British festival culture and about later, more recent festivals. And there is a slight sort of jazzy um, influence in, in, in what I'm doing because that's where a lot of my research interests come from. I've looked at the relationship between jazz and social movements in Britain. And I was very interested in the way in which marching bands um, were used in the campaign for nuclear, nuclear disarmament and all the master marches from the 1950s on. You had this sort of American marching military soundtrack to this peaceful, in some ways, anti-American movement and I want to explore the tensions between those. And you'll see all the references in the early material here to, uh, to some of that. Um, I'm also involved in a, a, an EU, which one, no, I don't know, well, anyway, one of the EU projects, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an international one to do with European jazz and national identity. And uh, anyway, we have our final conference, big international conference, we've got about 90 papers so far. Uh, next April, and it's on jazz cultures, I think, Europe and jazz cultures. So if anyone is interested in those fields, either come or submit a paper. It might be a bit late for the paper, but if you send something to me, I'm sure we can find, it in, uh, find a way of putting it in there because we haven't meant to, I'm sort of out the pounds yet. And that will take place at Salford, which for anyone who was at the, the Aspen conference about two months ago, you will know that it's a, 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 you know, a dynamic, fab and successful uh, conference venue, much like this. <laughs> okay. The 1950s as a festival decade in the United Kingdom is initiated by the Festival of Britain in 1951, a post-war nationwide celebration of national survival, residual imperial identity, desire beyond austerity. But with the youthful explosion of popular music, from trad jazz to the folk revival to rock and roll, 
as well as the establishment of the pop singles charts based on record sales from 1952 on, I've been interested in tracing the development of a, 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 an alternative festival practice. What I haven't given much thought, though, uh, to here to date, which is important for Transatlantic Live Music Exchange, <coughs> is the end of the Musicians' Union, American Federation of Musicians, um, ban on mutual exchange of musicians in the mid-1950s. I didn't really think of that until I was thinking about live music and exchange, so there's an area for me to, to go and do a bit more work, or even better, to find that someone's already done it, and then just read this. <laughs> I'm interested in contributing to our understanding of the relation between popular music, festival, and activism by focusing on an important area in uh, festival history of Britain, which can, uh, what can arguably seen, be seen as its originary decade, the 1950s. So I chart and interrogate the 50s in Britain from the perspective of the rise of socio-cultural experimentation in the context of youth, some of the Kevin Morgan's term, new, old, sonic landscapes of popular music, social practice, and political engagement. I foregrounded the shifting cultures of the street, of public space, of this extraordinary period, when urgent and compelling questions of youth, race, colonialism and independence, migration and affluence, were being posed to the accompaniment of new soundtracks and new forms of dress and dance and social gathering. Some of the more important popular music Popular culture events where these features manifested, performed and celebrated themselves produce what I see as a significant phenomenon, the youthful gathering of the festival, the surprising splash and clash of street culture, even if it's in a field or down a lane. Presenting the 1950s as a decade of festival rather than simply one of, say, post-war austerity, or think of uh, the American poet Robert Lau, who called the 1950s this narcotized decade and I don't think that was in a psychoactive sense, is, is an argument considerably aided by the 1951 opening event. After all, its purpose over five summer months in London and nationwide was to present, from the uh, Festival of Britain 1950 leaflet, exhibitions, art festivals, conferences, pageantry, championships, sporting events, simple village celebrations, the living record of a nation at work and play. Never before has anything been planned, been planned quite like the Festival of Britain. <coughs> Its outward manifestations will be gay and arresting. Its serious purpose will be to demonstrate the continuing vitality of the British people in the arts, science and industry, and their ability and determination to play their full part, now as in the past, in the peaceful progress of mankind. Uh, Becky Conakin has argued for a complex understanding of the Festival of Britain that presented competing versions of Britain and Britishness. It was a government strategy to increase foreign tourism. It was a labor extravaganza with a social democratic agenda. So, as here, some of the significant music festival events in both city and country from the 50s are the Sydney Folks Festival from 1955 on, Soho Fair, 55, I think, to 57 or 58, three years in London. This is the first line. So I did a lot of work on Colgan and the Omega Brass Band. And they were the first kind of marching uniform brass band in Britain to do the whole New Orleans thing. And Collier had recently been in New Orleans as a merchant uh, sailor. In fact, at the same time as Collier was in New Orleans, Edward Lord Montague, as a young man, was in New Orleans too. We'll come back to him tomorrow. This is Serpo uh, Fair. Oh, yeah, yes, that's it. According to Jeff Nuttall in Bond Culture, which is one of the best books of that period, um, you know, he described Soho Fair as the carnival of the ravers, so good it had to be banned. <coughs> and here is Nuttall. Nuttall is the, uh, the guy in the pale trousers playing the cornet behind the Duet Scottish guy in the kilt, who's called Jock, of course. And to Nuttall's right, with the, um, the whippet or the greyhound, are the, the Alberts, um, for anyone who's interested in that kind of period. Here's the Omega Brass Band on a CMD march, about 1960. You've got this, uh, you know, this American marching music. The CMD is an effort to revive kind of Britain's moral leadership in the world, and then uh, they're marching past the uh, the the, the, uh, the Albert Hall. You've got these kind of competing versions of empire, post empire, and so on going on. <coughs> and the Trinidadian Carnival in London, 1959, which is a sort of precursor to uh, Notting Hill. 
There is a cluster of issues around social change, youth, popular music, race, national identity, carnivalesque eruption, and political engagement, within and frequently breaking out of the special boundary space and practice of the festival. <coughs> My first argument, then, is that the new formations of social and cultural galleries in 1950s festivals reflected and generated developments in modes of political identity, that the crowds observing and participating exploited these group opportunities for solidarity, that the new public spaces carved out, even if temporarily, were often understood or claimed as expressions of cultural creativity and social innovation at the same time. What attracts me here as elsewhere are strands of the zeitgeist of cultural innovation, the often elusive or discarded cultural traces that really do or did melt into the air. And I am hearing music in particular now. There are some persistent difficulties with such critical terrain. Tracing the influence or impact of some cultural forms at the time under discussion is problematic due to their elusive, emotive, or transitory nature. And the festival as a carnivalesque combination of pop and protest may be emblematic in this context. Four such cultural forms and practices have not always been treated well over the course of time. Some have been discarded or forgotten or remembered without prestige. Interestingly though, more recently, the festival is one of those areas of research which has been well suited to the, line, uh, to the rise of the enthusiast's website full of dates, archive photos, details of lineups, scans of original posters and tickets, all wonderful and often accurate information. With the added bonus of exploiting interactive functionality to be able to include readers' memories and accounts of having been there. And you know, that's quite nice from, a, from an academic perspective. Um, for example, when I read this book about 12, 13 years ago, I did this whole timeline of festival culture just for my own, just to kind of, for the backbone of the book really, for my own research, just to try and get a sense of when, you know, when, when, when was the Bath Blues Festival, uh, when did Glastonbury start, when, when were the Stonehenge, what was the relationship between the People's Free Festival at Windsor and Stonehenge, etc., etc. And I ended up with this, I don't know, 20,000 words or something, just a year by year chronology. And I chatted with the, uh, with the editor, with my commissioning editor at the publisher, and then he said, oh, I know what. We'll use that and we'll put it in the middle of the book and we'll have a whole section called Timeline of Festival Culture and it will have a, um, a set of cover photos in it as well. And, um, and that at the time struck me as a really like, terrific way of trying to make use of what had been a bit of academic research but didn't necessarily have much purpose then. Of course now it would simply have been put on a, on a website and, uh, and used in, uh, in a way that say the archive has done for um, UK rock festivals. Okay. I want to focus on Beauty Jazz Festival, 1956 to 61. Melody Maker, 1962, June. We're festival crazy. In the past five years, we have gone festival crazy. From Lord Montague's brainchild, the Beauty Jazz Festival, the whole industry has grown. Bands which used to look upon the summer as the slack season now find themselves on a dozen or more well-paid festival dates. The National Jazz Festivals of Richmond, Earlswood, and Wynwood are now among the firmly established annual events. Um, in Jeremy Sanford's view in the first book to chronicle the British pop festival movement, Tomorrow's People, from 1974, <coughs> as Beaulieu developed, it was the 1958 event that was the first British festival proper, a two-day event that attracted 4,000 people. And here are some Beaulieu festival girls in 1961. They look pretty good, I think. So you can see that the girl on the right, who also figures in the one on the left, is, uh, has a little CMD pad. So quite, there's a lot of crossover between Aldermaston and Beaulieu. You go to Aldermaston at Easter, and then Beaulieu in July and August. You can see the same bands. For Mick Farron, self-styled British White Panther, less kindly also called the One Man Tribe, Alternative press journalist, leader of the Free Festival Band, The Deviants, and organizer, if that's not too strong a term, of the 1970 Fun City, P-H-U-N, festival. The scarcely plausible figure of Ackerbilk during the trad craze could be ignored because, although trad was nowhere near as solid as Elvis or Jerry Lee or Little Richard, it did at least bop along in a jolly manner. You could get drunk on cider and nobody got uptight, although the older patrons did refer to the teenage invaders as ravers. This was all, he continues, the group was looking for. 
It was a collective title, it defined them, and they could at last rejoice in a separate identity. Bewley's subculture was indeed eccentric. A group of 15 teenage boys from Worthing called themselves the Barbarians. They wore caveman gear, fur loincloths, presumably cut from old fur coats, and they carried wooden clubs. One girl's long white shirt had on her back painted, Idiots of the World, United. And many other fans had slogan clothes. A movie turned newsreel at one festival shows how, as the newsreader says, fans forget the conventional life and act like crazy. On the other hand, the Daily Mail, we'll come back to that August publication, saw in Raver an ugly new word for an ugly new menace. Melody Maker, keen to puff Bewley because of its own organisational links with it, media, music, festival, crossover, identified some of its retro appeal in 1958 in its description <coughs> of the festival as the blending of the music of today with memories of centuries gone by. Bewley was organised by the young heir to the Bewley estate, Edward Lord Montagu. Montagu, bisexual, newly married, not that long out of prison for homosexuality following a cause celebre trial, um, a police drive against homosexual acts in 1953-54 led to a number of trials and convictions. Writing in The Independent in 1999, Philip Hall called the Montague case the highest profile gay trial since Oscar Wilde. It was a sensation. He comes out of prison and he starts a jazz festival for everyone, right? They come to him, they listen to music, they dance around, they drink cider, they smoke around, and they fucking And this is Montague. There's got to be something. I asked him about that. He didn't really want to talk too much about it. I didn't put it in those terms. <laughs> I mean, he's just a peer of the realm, you know. <laughs> okay, Montague would have to be flexible if he was to survive and prosper. He had just come, you know, he was the young heir. He'd just come into the estate. If he was to survive and prosper through the partial collapse of the upper class and what McKibben calls the relative decline of the significance of landed wealth and the increasing diversity of wealth. Montague saw those twin icons of transatlantic modernity, jazz and motor cars, the Beauty Motor Museum, established first by his father and expanded greatly by Montague himself, as the means of diversification to protect his privileged patch and parcel of England, his 8,000 acres. As noted, Montague's motivation was to exploit the personal taste, a love of music, in his case jazz, as part of the diversification of the commercial portfolio of the estate. Not so very different from what the Sunset Farmer Michael Evers would do on his then very small patch of land at Worthy Farm in 1970, agricultural diversification. More interestingly, perhaps, we can see Montague as the upper class innovator of exploiting his land and the touristic attraction of the stately home for the energetically clashing mass cultural event of the Fog Festival. Think also here of the Festival of the Flower Children, <coughs> Burburn Abbey in 1967. Uh, this is the poster. And um, top of the bill, the Duke of Bedford. A modest chap. By kind permission of His Grace, the Duke of Bedford. Or the Nedworth Park Rock Festivals of 1974 on, hosted by Lady Little Paul. And there are other examples. After beauty from the early 60s, Harold Pendleton's work in particular shows the trajectory of, of jazz as precursor of festival culture with his Richmond Jazz Festivals organized under the aegis of the National Jazz Federation. Pendleton was skilled in identifying changing tastes in popular music and in booking newer bands. As he observed on the 1965 Richmond Jazz Festival, quote, over the past year or so, the hit parade has been getting crowded with groups whose roots are in jazz. He learned this through his involvement in both the Marquee Club in London and with some of the later Bewley Jazz Festivals. The Richmond Festivals <coughs> encapsulated the musical and social transformation of the time. In the space of a few years in the early 60s, the shift is from retro trap jazz and blues of Akabilk, Ken Collier, Alex Welsh, towards the new popular music and audience of the blues-oriented bands such as the Rolling Stones, the Yardbirds, and the Man. The 1965 National Jazz Festival was the moment when this change in youth consciousness, music, instrumentation, style became most clear. As the festival publicity articulated, quote, something unheard of is happening at Richmond, 
For the first time, the pure jazz men are outnumbered by beat and rhythm and blues groups who are no stranger to the hip parade. The festival is something of a teenager's ascot, the only social occasion on a national scale when they can try out new clothes. Pete Townsend of The Who saw weaknesses in this shift from jazz to rock, even though he was a prime mover in it and beneficiary of it. Quote from Townsend, something happened between the trad age and rock. In the trad age, there were great people doing great things, founding CMD or Amnesty International, and uh, trying to mobilize young people. But then the whole subject of politics and the power of the individual to affect change was buried under this tidal wave of rock. The events at Richmond would feature most of the familiar elements of festival culture for both its proponents and opponents, as outlined by Michael Clark in his 1982 book, The Politics of Pop Festivals, um, which is probably uh, the kind of the most important book, I think, about the pop uh, festival culture from an academic perspective. Long out print, if you can get a copy or a photocopy, it's, uh, it's essential. According to Clark, the invasion of large numbers of young people into the pleasanter parts of the countryside for a weekend or a week in the summer, to camp in the open, listen to music, usually loud, sometimes to consume drugs, and in the context of the espousal of overtly bohemian values involving attitudes to property and sexuality, for example, that are at gross variance with those of the local population, is inevitably a strong base for opposition. I would emphasize, though, that the majority of these common features were inherited from beauty, expected by audiences as a result of their experiences at or their mediated images of beauty. Christopher Booker's claim in the Sunday Telegraph in 1961 that the prospect for the promoters of jazz festivals during the sober 60s seemed happily cool was only partly correct. Jazz festivals did indeed wane, but the decade was hardly to be characterized or mythicized by sobriety. And festivals were to become a central form of social expression and gathering, both in the 60s and arguably succeeding decades, even more so. We can identify the Beauty Jazz Festival, National Jazz Festival origins, even in the enduring Reading Rock Festival. Reading is the most important of the British rock festivals, and it tends to get neglected because it's pretty uncool. And, uh, but it's been there for the longest, and it can trace its trajectory as historical kind of problems back to the first as well. Um, note the traditional trad uh, trumpet on an old-fashioned chair logo, even in the Reading festivals, which in 1977 <coughs> and 79 were headlined by the likes of Thin Lizzy or the sensational Alex Harvey Band. Not really trad. A little bit more on Bewley, and then I'll move on. This is the poster for the 1960 Bewley Festival. This is where it all went wrong. What Montague did was to have an ambitious um, bill, and he wanted to attract so many audience members that he thought, well, we'll have both the Travers, the traditional jazz bands, and the modernists, the modern jazz bands. So you can see on there, from a trap perspective, uh, can you see? Can you read that? I can barely see it myself. Um, do those blinds go down easily or not really? Yeah, I'll come down. Um, so uh, there's kind of George Melly, Alex Welsh, Roy uh, Forbes, and um, Mick Mulligan, um, Ackerville from the Trad End, and then there's Joe Harriet, uh, Johnny Dangworth, Tully Harry from the Mod Men, and they're all due to play the festival. At the 1960 Bewley Jazz Festival, the Trad clarinetist and somehow pop star Ackerville entered on a Model T4 courtesy of the Motor Museum. By the end of Saturday night, though, vehicles have been targeted by festival goers for destruction. While Acker played Jazz Up, J A Z D U P, I made that word, that's pretty poor actually, but it's but my jazz version of Love Up. Do you see what I'm trying to do? Yeah, it's a bit poor. And then uh, Jazz Up Youth climbed, I tried it and I thought that will really go that one and I'll have a life of its own, but no one's ever used it. <laughs> jazz Up uh, Youth climbed a scaffolding writing rig and removed horses from the roundabout stage and mounted them on rigging as they climbed. A storage set shed was set alight. A 1921 14-seater Charabon had its hood burned. Over the Saturday night riot, <coughs> none people were injured. Uh, none seriously, though two people were subsequently jailed for assaulting police officers. Um, for George Melly, it wasn't a vicious riot, it was stupid. 
the tradies and rave gear booing the modern jazz Johnny Danko had done. Others viewed <coughs> exuberant youth quite differently. The Daily Mail, again, why do ravers rave? At which point your enthusiasm and hygiene twist into the urge to hate and destroy them. Wacky dress and wild fun do not necessarily spell delinquency. Yet, for a certain fall product of our affluent society, this seems to have become a rebel's uniform of viciousness. And the degree of time, the male continues, between beating up a jazz festival and beating up Negroes in Notting Hill and Jews in Germany. Okay, for some of those anti-nuclear weapons and peace activists and idealistic jazz fans who had been on the Aldermaster's CND march a few months earlier, it must have come a surprise to be now compared to racists and fascists. Montague himself was to say that, quote, and uh, this is from one of the movie, movie term newsrooms, and he has a real look of panic on his face. Um, you'd need a policeman in every garden in Beulah Village if the festival was held again. Hardly the image of pastoral promise to transmit. The beatnik beat up, as it was headlined in one newspaper, was reported in the Commonwealth and World Press. South Africa, the United States, Argentina, Gibraltar, Australia, Kenya, Canada, Italy, Germany, France, all reported it hugely. The combination of aristocracy and jazz madness was an outstanding popular story of English eccentricity run literally right. The Battle of Beauty was in part a symptom of jazz purists' involvement in their particular form. Subcultural tensions between traditional jazz fans and modernists were evident. The favoured slogan of Travis was, go home, dirty bopper. And um, that's just such a great thing that introduced on a banner at uh, Birmingham Town Hall in 1959 or 60 when uh, Bruce Turner, saxophonist, dared to play with Humphrey Lipton. And uh, Lipton was more of a traveller and Turner was more of a modernist. And they knew he was going to play with fans, so they painted this band and they hung out and did his first solo, go home, dirty bopper. This kind of tension may explain the irreparable damage inflicted on Acker Bilk's banjoist instrument. The banjo was truly despised by modernists. <coughs> there is a retrospectively intriguing coda to the Beaulieu Jazz Festival. The 1962 Daily Mail article described, I wonder why Montague kept all the Daily Mail stuff in the press um, um, archive. Uh, uh, anyway, a Daily Mail article describes the extraordinary early invention of a proto-free festival of the kind organized extensively in Britain in the 70s and early 80s. This indicates the distance between festival goers and festival organizers and the increasing <coughs> autonomy of Carnival. Quote from the mail. Like Frankenstein, Lord Montague of Beaulieu has created a monster from which it seems there is no escape. After the Beatnik riots last year, Lord Montague vowed there will never again be a jazz festival of Beaulieu. Um, but last night he told me that he has had to appeal to the police for protection from the jazz beatniks who threatened to descend on the picturesque Hampshire village again. Thousands of leaflets have been distributed in Chelsea exhorting the trads and moderns to turn up in force in August for a free rave to the bitter end. Their leaflets, signed by one Pete the Brolly, said, if you can play any musical instrument, please bring it with you and help make a successful weekend for everyone. Spread the news and rave on. The uncertainty of this putative Bewley Free Festival's countercultural or subcultural construction should not detract from its importance as an early manifestation of more radical DIY youth culture, or at least its desire. Um, it also provides evidence of the emotional and social investment the audiences at Bewley developed in making the festival their own over the years that it ran, even to the extent of claiming it as their own autonomous event. Outside a London court, <coughs> Outside a London court, following a £10 fine for possession of cannabis found during a raid on the candlelit Chelsea Jazz Club, Café des Artistes, Pete the Broy owned up, quote, another Daily Mail piece, I am the cat who has been distributing thousands of leaflets in Chelsea and throughout the country, exhorting anyone who can play a musical instrument to come to an unofficial beauty jazz festival. <coughs> Wild pastoral living, self-policing, DIY music making and a non-commercial economy. Many of the ingredients of the free festival movement are glimpsed here up to a decade before its popularization in Britain and long before, a uh, similar, similar period of time before, the inspiration <coughs> of, say, Woodstock. 
the poor or political in the free co community of desolation stroke devastation hill outside the fences of the 1970 Isle of Wight Festival. The 1970 IT financial quote fuck up its own description that became the free festival at Fun City. The 1971 free festival of Glastonbury Fear, organised and financed by upper class dropouts like Andrew Carr and Arabella Churchill. These were the early manifestations of the free festival movement. <coughs> but as an ideological social movement of sorts in Britain, free festivals came into their own with Windsor for People's Free in 1972 and then the best known, Stonehenge Free, from 1974 on. I found a book <coughs> that I had on Stonehenge and I used to, when in the mid 80s, I was a, I, I was a squatter in Camden actually. And then um, and I've got this little street sticker off a lamppost in Camden Town and it says something like Stonehenge 85, free festival, be there or be square. Right? And there were millions of people over <coughs> Camden. And at the same time, in, in Time Out, there was an ad from English Heritage about the festival saying the National Trust and English Heritage regret to announce that the free festival will not be allowed on their land, on the land a Stonehenge cared for by them this year or in the future. And there's this, you know, this kind of um, this struggle played out for the 1985 Free Festival. <coughs> in a way, with Pete Broly, with Pete the Broly, Beauty was present at the lost beginning of the movement, the Free Festival movement, and also at its notorious arrest, the Battle of the Beanfield near Stonehenge, where the large convoy of new travellers on its way to the Stones for the 1985 festival, this one, was violently ambushed and broken up by the police. And uh, these were some of my press card that I just found when I looked in a book of mine about Stonehenge a couple of days ago, and I've forgotten that a couple of examples I just spoke about it. Who was the head of English Heritage during this time in the mid-1980s? Yes, Lord Montague of the Bewley Jazz Festival himself. <laughs> at Bewley in 1960 and in leaflet form at least 1962, as at Stonehenge during and after 1985, the, the aristocratic imperative to grant and control freedom of festival was challenged and rejected. As is its wont, carnival would not be so easily limited. It required its potential for social inversion to be fulfilled. Festival culture today. There is some continuity in the political interrogation and potential of the festival, um, a perhaps residual cultural studies desire for cultural politics rather than the discourse and practice of <coughs> cultural policy or the creative economy. For Andrew Blake in his 1997 book, The Land Without Music, the notion of a popular festival can be a way of proposing a truly vital cultural politics. And in the past couple of years, um, Graham St. John has explored the characteristics and recent history of the protestable festival protest, put it together again, protestable. Uh, the carnival of protest that's flourished with the advent of the alter globalization movement. Uh, yet, and I almost feel I need to say, with this kind of history that I've outlined, surprisingly, popular music festivals are one of the strikingly successful and enduring features of seasonal, seasonal popular cultural consumption for young people and older generations of enthusiasts <coughs> to date. In fact, a dramatic rise in the number of music festivals in the UK and around the world has been evident as festivals become a pivotal economic driver in the popular music industry and in the seasonal cultural economy. One recent report by Mintel suggests that the British music festival market is worth over £180 million per annum. In 2010, there were over 700 music festivals in Britain alone, and it's estimated that 3 million people attended music festivals, attend music festivals each year. And I bet if you go to the Live Music Exchange website, you'll get even more accurate and up-to-date uh, statistics than those. Today's festivals range from the massive, such as Ross Kilda or Glastonbury Festival, Notting Hill Carnival, or, until recently, Love Parade, to local, small-scale, or the recently innovative boutique festivals. The festival has cemented its place in the pop and rock, um, and in the seasonal cultural economy. It's become a key feature of contemporary music industry's commercial model, and one of major interest to young and older with an intergenerational perspective, people as festival goers themselves and as students. Uh, so, you know, if you were doing your degree at Southampton, what's it called, Southampton, Solent University, you can do your uh, masters in festival culture, and you get a placement at festival, for, for example, you know, as part of it. Um, boutique festival, a bit of glamping, hire a pre-pitched and carpeted TP or a V-dub for the weekend, a costly cross-generational country break. No bits. 
in the digital world, the live music event is seen as one of the you know kind of saviors of the popular music industry. I made that rather glib statement. I thought I wish I hadn't said it because I'm sure it'd be up to debate. But anyway, I don't stand by it. I'll be lying. And, uh, and in a digital world, the potential for terminal, laptop, or mobile alienation is cancelled by the congregationist imperative of the festival's mass social gathering. <coughs> and you know, you can dress up. Um, Alice O'Grady and Rebecca Kill have been working on research about um, the dressing up and what they call relational performance. In addition to scheduled musical acts and program performances, the festival site bursts with another layer of performance namely performances that implicate festival goers in a direct and embodied way. And they've developed this notion of relational performance in contemporary music festivals, and particularly looking at the way with which people dress and the use of fancy dress at festival culture. How does dressing up shape the experience of the festival as a whole? What impact does this have on <coughs> festival identity? How does relational performance help bridge the gap between performer, participant, and punter? If you want an extreme other to that, you might go to Burning Man, where you kind of have to be basically stripped down effectively, and uh, you are the festival and nothing else but it. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about place, because I think I said would. Emma Webster on the Live Music Exchange. Well, festivals are events outside the ordinary, no matter how mainstream they may have become, perhaps. My preference is for spaces. <coughs> for spaces that evoke wonder and delight, like circuses or fun fairs, rather than having the feel of a car boot so. But hey, me too. Uh, this involves colourful stripy tents, flags and banners on poles, and by encouraging fancy dress among the festival goers. seen with beauty from the 1950s um, in the New Forest, the pastoral attraction of that green space in Hampshire. I think there is more to festival place than the upwardly striving flagpole, heavenly verticality. All the colourful big top, hippie saying, you're never too old for a happy child. Indeed, when Montague got involved in the impressive building of the 1963 Manchester Jazz Festival, the importance of the genius loci of Bewley and the New Forest could be glimpsed when offered the industrial urban north of Manchester instead of the bucolic New Forest. Audiences ironically prompted <coughs> by the presence in publicity of Montague connecting this festival with the earlier Bewley ones um, refused. They refused Manchester and the, uh, the event flopped. And I think place is one of the key reasons why, say, Glastonbury endures and indeed thrives. Glastonbury, not a festival of the 1960s at all, of course, but from the 1980s on. I.e., Glastonbury is a product of Thatcherism. It's the genius loci, the spirit of the place, that attracts or resonates. The early 20th century occultist, yeah, right, okay. Uh, I get a little bit, sort of, you know, a room. It takes me back to Stonehenge and the Stone Circles in 1984 and Free Festival, mm -hmm. there's all the drums and the horses and the sounds that people were around. And then um, Sid Rawls, the self styled king of the hippies, he was going around the beer mug with some Stonehenge mud in it and blessing everyone, you see. Well, I was an arco or an arco punk at the time, but nonetheless, I've always been glad that Sid Rawls blessed me at Stonehenge in 1984 within the Stones. <coughs> um, right, so here we go. It's the genius loci, the spirit of the place, that attracts or resonates. The early 20th century occultist, writer, and ethical vegetarian, Dion Fortune, centred most of her energies around Glastonbury and was responsible for coining the phrase Avalonians to describe the collection of like-minded souls, eccentrics, believers who congregated there looking for spiritual fulfilment. From Arimathea, and where is, was that? To Arthur and Avalon, what was it Fortune said of Glastonbury? The veil is thin here. You can see through senior police officer uh, responsible for security at the festival said to me when I interviewed him for the, for, for the Glastonbury book, yeah, well, you've got to remember, George, it is the Vale of Avalon. <coughs> and then, uh, I, obviously, I sent him the transcription, I always send people the transcription, and he phoned me up and said, there's just one line I want to change, and it's that one because it makes me sound like a real hippie, you know. 
And uh, he, he, it is what he said, <coughs> but he didn't really want it to be said quite like that. So I didn't need to make it. Uh, a little aside, other festival sites, land plots for the temporary event include some rural event spaces, such as country showgrounds, more commonly people by horticultural events, the early bar blues festivals that inspired my believers, as chef and now, or underused horse race courses, Plumpton, 1970, derelict or neglected airfield, Watchfield People's Free Festival, 1970, <coughs> a redundant military site donated by the government, by the way, so that they could hold a free festival there. Black Bush Aerodrome, 1978, when Dylan played his first UK gig for years, Phoenix Festival at an airport in Long Master in the mid 90s. Another festival site on an old rubbish tip. The first wedding, 1971. No jokes, that's not fair. Industrial Wasteland. Bickershaw, Lancashire, 1972, with a grateful day. Blasted Heathland. Crumlin, Yorkshire Moors, 1970. People are treated for exposure in the hail and the sleet. In August, Ginger Baker offered to play for free on Sunday, but there's no one there. Finally, another, another kind of instance of the, the space claim for festival. From the autonomous political perspective, squatted or land grabbed commons. Think of Castle Morton Common, 1992, the culmination of the free rave stroke festival revival crossover. Um, Mary Ann Wright, who researched that festival, the Castle Morton, the big kind of mega rave there. When she turned up, she got off the bus and she knew there's a mega rave going on, 20,000 people, but she couldn't find it. And so there was a policeman in the village, she asked him, and then the policeman said, yeah, down that lane, turn left half a mile in the next field. <laughs> and um, so, you know, and at Stonehenge, one of the early Stonehenge festivals, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the poor quality generator, breaking news, um, failed. And so um, the police kind of moved their cars so that they'd be in front of the stage, and then they lit the stage with their headlights. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not all, you know, battles. Um, Glastonbury spiritualities. <coughs> this is to do with the idea of place uh, somewhere like Glastonbury. Um, yeah, landscape and landscape interventions at somewhere like. Uh, okay, so this guy, I was at Glastonbury tour a couple of years ago, and then he was just sitting there confirming, confirming the space, confirming the cliche, if you like, the stereotype of it. He was meditating on the tour. Landscape and landscape interventions, for example at Glastonbury, are atavisms enhanced and multiplied. Let's locate the stage right here, said the dancer, on this ley line. Ley lines. The sight line along the valley must offer for festival goers a view of the tall and St. Michael's Tower. Build, then rebuild the stage in the shape of an uh, ancient pyramid. Let's make a neo Neolithic stone circle up in the green fields. All these ways of reaching into the past. Of course, while for Dion Fortune the veil is thin at Glastonbury, we ought to acknowledge the extent to which, during one early summer weekend of a festival year, with 135,000 visitors, thousands of cars and tents, miles of metal track laid across green fields, a massive temporary infrastructure of food and water supplies and waste management, and lots and lots of loud amplified music, the veil, if it exists, may thicken considerably. Um, the turn against the festival. This is me moving towards the end. And to think of the banal, the repetitive of pop festivals. And yet, even here, you know, the, it's the same thing year in, year out. Even here, I was talking with Chris Anderson, who's doing a chapter in a book I'm editing called Carnivalizing Pop, which is about festival culture. And he wanted to look at the repetitive, but he talks about cyclical re-performance of the unique, and that seemed to me a, a rather, a rather um, rosy version of things, you know, and that we could we do something more critical. And I wonder there if um, what we're lacking really in academia is a more critical interrogation of, um, of the limits, you know. Why don't you have academics saying, Jesus, they're bad, these festivals, what are they, crap, you know, and, uh, and so on, and then to uh, critique and theorize that. Um, the over-commercialized. Andrew Bengry Howell and, and uh, others from uh, then the ESRC project at Bath have explored the recent growth and the popularity of music festivals and their position as a profit stream for multinational corporations. And they plucked from one of the uh, Live Nations documents this notion of the monetized type 
and they've done some work on the monetized pipe, which is basically you put all the events in one end of the pipe, and then money comes out the other end. <laughs> and um, yeah, who wouldn't like one of those? But, I mean, a phrase taken from a, a live nation. Major music festivals are increasingly branded events with substantial levels of commercial involvement and relatively managed and regulated forms of consumption on offer. Um, they chart that, um, but they're also interested in the extent to which the continuing popularity of the major music festival as a session begins to bite. And what they've done is that these, these uh, colleagues and researchers from Bath have picked up uh, Dave Lang's kind of you know, argument about the apparent dichotomy between carnival and commerce. And they explore the complex relationship between commerce and carnival and the range of impacts that corporatization has had from the perspective of participants. Commerce, in their conclusion, commerce and carnival are not necessarily oppositional, but intersect such that commerce tends to shape the space in which the experience of the festival can be commodified and consumed. Um, you go all the way back in the festival culture. Back to Montague. Why did he do it? Because he, uh, he wanted to raise money to preserve his estate. Why did we have the Isle of Wight? Because they wanted to raise money for the municipal swimming pool. Um, I looked at a company called Orange Dot, a London-based creative agency with, this is important, they tell us this on the website, a satellite office in New York. <coughs> Art, music, culture, advertising, Orange Dot are involved with festival culture today and recognize and seek to exploit the cultural process. Yeah, even Orange Dot recognises there's something special and different about the festival, something that is easily losable. And who would be bold here and say, even transcendent? No, me neither. <laughs> you can read that, I'm not going to follow The end of festival. Did a lot of knocking copy over the last few years. Luke Bainbridge in the Garden in 2012 writing a piece entitled Have We Fallen Out of Love with the Great British Music Festival? This followed a 2011 cover article in The Garden, film and music supplement entitled Has the Festival Bubble Finally Burst? The Daily Mail, never a friend of the festival as we have seen, ran a similar story in 2011 but rather more joyously headed. The headline was Festivals Are Dead! <laughs> and uh, and uh, Evis, Michael Evis, said at the end of the 2011 Glastonbury, just a week later, and uh, so when he's you know, feeling a bit down and he's totally exhausted, uh, there is a feeling that people have seen it all before. His daughter Emily did a kind of set of press releases after that, a press interview, where she said, no, 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 Dad, he was just feeling a bit tired. Um, ticket prices, the corporatization of festival space, the repetition and similarity, the cultural redundancy, <laughs> Competition from exotic overseas festivals, the same old Live Nation headline acts, the weather. I did see reports this year blaming global warming and saying that global warming was responsible for the end of festival music in Britain because of the summer 2012 rain and the forecast of greater summer wet weather in the future. And we can already, even in this kind of small instance, go back to something like um, Bewley. In 1962, the jazz musician and journalist Benny Green talked about Bewley as a watery imitation of their American counterparts. He was really thinking about Newport Jazz Festival. But we could think in this context about the word watery. From a micro perspective as well, we can see other live music developments. You know more about this than I do. In recent years, the Gorilla Gig, the pop-up event, the Get It Loud in Library Circuit. Maybe these micro events are kind of, you know, shifting an interest in, uh, in the mass festival happening. And yet, Glastonbury, 2013. This was 2000, actually. This is a sunrise. And uh, the other image is a teepee circle up in the green fields. I took that photo when I was there. And I love the fact there was a kind of village green circle of residences, um, a circling behind that, the trees, and then above that, the open skies. And it's that, actually, that photo that made me start thinking about a festival as some kind of weird garden. And then, as a result, I wrote this book, Radical Gardening, Politics, Idealism, and Rebellion in the Garden. <laughs> um, right. Oh yeah, and the, the dedicatees in that book are uh, Penny Ramburn from Crass, and uh, who was sort of partly responsible for the first Stonehenge Festival, and uh, Andrew Carr, who was the organiser of the 1971 the legendary Glastonbury Fair. There's quite a lot of festival in that book. Okay, Glastonbury 2013. This is to uh, counter a lamentable ending, i.e. an ending of the net. 135,000 tickets at £205 each sold out in record time in one hour and 40 minutes. 
Online purchase involved pre-registration, which several hundreds of thousands of people did. I didn't, I never will, obviously. And festival goers don't even yet know what the lineup is, let alone the headliners. Can the festival, or this one at least, be such a special live music event that we buy into it without knowing what the live music is going to be? Emily Evis, Michael's daughter, who's kind of taken over the last few years. When people go to buy a ticket, they don't know who's playing. So many people come here for reasons beyond music. It's important to keep tickets available for people who are coming for all the other reasons and who aren't just fans of a particular band. For all the other reasons and beyond music. In your um, studies, is there anything um, that's, and uh, research is in your knowledge, anything that's come about um, that shows you where festivals are? I mean, there wasn't any mention of Wales, for instance, in anywhere. Uh, and yet the West Country, particularly Stonehenge and now Glastonbury, seems to have a strong pull. Why is that? I mean, is there any relationship to where they are, apart from, you know, disused airfields and location of population? Why is the West Country so strong in festivals? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 yes, okay. Um, I think the West Country is stronger than, say, the North East because of this, partly because of this atavistic desire on the part of early festival organisers. They wanted a special magic place to hold the festival. And so that could have been Stonehenge, it could have been Glastonbury, anywhere but that sort of resonant space of ancient landscape and the possibility of tapping into something to give and to um, both to give the festival a specialness and also to, um, to mark the place itself, you know, so that the festival becomes a celebration of that landscape spot. Okay, so you could do it there. Why not then do it in the northeast of England, where there are similar, you know, lots and lots of Neolithic landscapes and stuff like that? And then, uh, well, because of the weather, the weather plays a part too. And so, you know, the, there are those pragmatic, practical elements to it. Um, so uh, I think they, they sort of fulfill that. The reason I mentioned the kind of half a dozen other areas was because I felt I was getting a little bit too focused on, um, hey, isn't Glastonbury great? I never went to Glastonbury, I went to Stonehenge. And um, I dismissed Glastonbury, you know, as a kind of commercial event where all the, all the uh, safe people went, you know, whereas I was more edgy, dangerous, you know, ha -ha. And then, uh, uh, but of course, in, in, as I've matured, I have, um, I found that actually Glastonbury is a fabulously uh, uh, interesting and intriguing event. And, you know, it's the one that everyone around the world knows about Britain, and uh, it is, Look at the very fact that there's no Glastonbury this year, so what do they do? <coughs> they extend the ley line further east and they put a Mount Olympus and Glastonbury tour at the Olympic opening ceremony. You know, and that's already fabulous, just what I thought. And uh, it spoke of the importance of something like the Glastonbury Festival to British popular music and national culture. Just not a question, more an observation. I mean, uh, when you're talking about the place and reasons that people set up festivals, but you could have made an allusion to Clank the International Stadium, which was set up in post World War II, just to try and uh, bring you Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You're very right. I am. But it is a magical place. Still. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just adding to that, talking about resonant spaces, of course, one of the places that you left off was uh, the modern festivals that take place in holiday camps. Uh, Scotland's uh, camp yeah. sounds, uh, and uh, Pontins, and this is quite a history, actually. Yeah. It's not just, uh, you know, latterly. They've been going back to the Soul Weekenders for a long time. Uh, so that's kind of modern resonance first that it's only thinking about. No, you're right, actually. That's a very good point. I would, I, I, would, I would happily add both of those to my kind of list of sort of examples of resonance. And then of kind of something, well, perhaps mundane pleasure for that needs transformation or something like that. I don't know. Maybe that's a too critical to read. I don't know. Well, for instance, it takes the weather out of the Yeah, that's true. Yeah, right. yeah, but, you know, don't you want canvas? I mean, who doesn't want canvas at a festival? Well, I've seen no one like you've got canvas. I think that's just something else. Don't just forget that's what I think. It's all the rise of the city festivals. Well, we've obviously got Sydney here, tram lines in Sheffield, um, Great Escape in Brighton. Um, 
the connections uh, in the city of London. Um, but um, Liverpool Sound City, yeah. it feels like in our day to day lives, we almost want to bring the classical experience closer to us mm. and that the brain as well. Yeah, yeah, I sort of, um, I, I acknowledge that, you know, and in the bigger piece there is material about Notting Hill as a kind of prime, sort of, originally Trinidadian and then more widely Caribbean version, version of that. Um, I think as well there's something about the attraction of the festival for the British, which is to do with, for the English, or I don't know, really, probably, um, which is to do with the countryside and the attraction of the countryside and the pastoral, the idyllic, you know, and uh, actually that's not just to do with us when you went, if you were, anybody who, who saw the was researched um, Woodstock in 1969, that was originally um, uh, marketed as three days of retreat in the, in the countryside to get away from New York City, you know, so there's, there's always that kind of relationship, that powerful relationship between the festival as a gathering and as a, a residential gathering, you know, i.e. camping, you know, you go there, you make the community because you all stay there together for a while, and that, that usually takes place in the country. And those are the ones that really that interested me in particular, but I'll take the point. So, question back here. Yes, yeah, so our question. I, I, I want to add a twist to your closing remark. You said there was a piece by Luke Bainbridge who said, Have we fallen out of love with the festival? Actually, and he wrote that this year. But actually, Luke Bainbridge was involved with the establishment of a new festival in Port Marion, Festival in the Six. And so that piece was, wasn't actually a, him questioning, it was actually a promotion for his new festival. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, well, it was a very subtle promotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it, it, it made me think, hey, I must go to this guy's festival. <laughs> if anything, if I had realised that in my deeper reading, which I'll go back to and check, I would have thought, I bet he doesn't have an organised festival because he's, you know, he's not in copyright. <laughs> uh, but thanks. Yeah, I mean, a key thing, I think, just from that, which is one of the things that, that's obvious, but not obvious to someone mentions that. Underlying all this is land. Mm. And you know they've got to take place somewhere, ownership <coughs> of it, and that this kind of change from the 50s to now, from sort of landed gentry to um, corporatization of festivals, which I suppose kind of marks a general shift in power of Britain from aristocracy to, to corporation. I wonder if, if you think that that's got anything to do with you know the, the migration into the, into cities of festivals that's linked to how. You know what it what's easy to book and, and holiday camps. That's a factor. Um, well, I suppose if I was looking on a slightly larger, I'd say that festivals have have embraced the post ideological like most other things seem to have as well. You know, even while so the, what I mean by that is that you know you have this. With, it, it's all to do with land, just like the Squatters Handbook always says every year in the first page. Land is what it's all about. You know, and then um, and uh, um, when you had the free festival movement, there was this effort to land grab. So if you want to do a festival at Stonehenge, you say, we'll have those 17 fields. Well, they don't, they're not yours, you haven't got permission. And then boom, there's 25,000 people there. Well, what are they going to do about it? Except the rest of them, ones and twos, when people leave. But it's such a big gesture that, you know, at, at that time. And um, um, or the Winter Free Festival, the precursor of it, right? When they tried to, um, when uh, uh, Wally Hope and um, Ubi Dwyer, uh, sent a letter to the Queen inviting her to the to the Windsor Festival, which was effectively in her back garden. You know? And so there are those. There are, there's, there's the radical historical side to it, and that mostly that's either got lost or it's got transferred into other things. So we might see it say in the warehouse party scene of the, the free rave scene of the free party scene of the 90s and very early 2000s, or you might see it in say Graham St John with his notion of protest. He, he would probably identify and say occupy camps today. You know? And so there are still those strands of the ideological claiming of land for a political purpose. And, um, but the other side of it is that, that point I was making, that festivals have always been too much. Uh, if, we say, if we make this sort of obvious starting point, well, where does British festival culture sort of begin? It's more complicated than that, I acknowledge that. But if you look at Bulian from 56 to 61, it's about money. It's about him opening up. But then, um, ooh! You know, you can't do that. This is, don't, don't you, I own it, you know. I'll, I'll let you in, but you know, you have to pay money and you have to play by the rules. And then, first of all, pay, people pay money, and then they stop paying money, and then they stop playing by the rules. You know. um, great. We probably have time for one more question. I'm aware that uh, coffee has arrived and one gives a chance to have a more informal discussion. Uh, so, yeah, just, just one question, whether you'd agree because you know, we're all talking about 
that sort of commercialization here. You know, I mean, if, if you actually sort of go back to the principle of the medieval fair, okay, you have commerce, you have entertainment, mm -hmm. side by side, everybody got paid. The only difference really was that the entertainment was paid directly by the customer rather than through the rent. Yeah. So is there any great difference? The, um, well, there is in the sense that if you try to put on something that's free, and then if you have the history of an event which is about free, and free in Britain means two things. It means free of economic exchange, and it means free as in liberated. And that's the complication that the English language has, and that's why free festival means those two together. It's about a rejection of the economic model, and it's at the same time a claimed space of liberation and exploration of possibility. <coughs> and that all comes from that single word, free. <coughs> Um, so, if you've got that angle, <coughs> then uh, there is a challenge to the commercial model. Um, I'd also say that thinking about the East Anglian affairs from, um, say, early 1972 to mid 83, late 80s, um, they started as a kind of reinvented <coughs> medieval fair model. It was really slightly inspired by things like Monty Python and stuff like that. And, um, and th there was a kind of jerky medievalism there, which also tapped into a revived horse fair tradition. Gypsies there, and then um, and so in the early East Anglian fairs, which were like sort of festivals, um, they, there was this uh, sort of brilliant, I thought, kind of rural cultural development. Okay, and we don't usually look to the countryside for cultural innovations, and yet here was one. Cultural innovation happens in the cities; it's an urban thing, and yet here was one in the countryside, and in an uncool bit of the countryside, north, south, you know, and um, not even the west country, and. Um, uh, and in those, you had this medievalism, you had a, a, a horse fair tradition of gypsy and nomadism and traveling, and then um, you had the beginnings of a little festival culture network and stuff like that. Uh, but also people paid to get in to the fair. At the same time, there was only a hedge that ran the edge of it. And so everyone knew that if 600 people paid, 400 people were just walking through the hedge kind of thing. And then there was this easy kind of acceptance of that, and that there was a commercial and anti-commercial thing going on at the same time. And that struck me as a really, uh, as, a, as another useful model. Glastonbury used to be like that before they built the twin wall all the way around it with watchtowers. You know, that's quite a weird version of what it means to be free in the festival. <laughs> all right, well, I think we should probably um, leave it there, uh, but I'm sure that discussion will continue uh, in a more informed way over some refreshments, uh, so uh, a lot of food for thought there. Uh, just leaves me to, to thank George once again for, uh, for a really great keynote. Uh, thanks.